Komodo anti-spam gateway is designed to be a pre-perimeter defense. Why? Well, interesting little factoid for you. Roughly 80% of corporate infections come through email, either attachments or phishing links. 80% of consumer infections tend to come off the internet, but in the corporate arena, 80% from email. That's why it's meant to be a pre-primer defense. It becomes your pre-primer defense because not only is it filtering spam, both inbound and outbound, but it's also filtering out infected email attachments and emails containing phishing links. So your users are at less jeopardy putting our anti-spam gateway product in place. Interestingly enough, it is also a cloud-based product, and this has two benefits to you. Firstly, it's maintenance-free. If you're maintaining some rack-mounted tin, or even worse, some server-installed application, you are exposed to hardware maintenance, you are exposed to uh, having to update firmware uh, files, you are having to update well, know, software, you're having to update pattern files, you're having to uh, sacrifice network ports on your switches or your routers, uh, on your perimeter firewall, they have to maintain the security of the product sitting up in the DMZ, there's all sorts of maintenance and administrative overhead. With a cloud-based product, we're taking care of all of that for you. We're doing the hardware maintenance, we're doing the firmware maintenance, we're doing the pattern file updates and the software updates. So it's hands-off management for you once you've done your MX record redirection, because that's all it takes. The secondary benefit, not often realized, is that your users now spend less time complaining about YouTube buffering on their, in their browsers. Why? Because we are withholding all that unwanted traffic at the cloud layer with your perimeter device or with your inst uh, server installed application all of that traffic is getting to you with us in place it doesn't come anywhere close to you so your three clear benefits of anti-spam gateway is one we're removing unwanted mail whether that be spam infected attachments or phishing links two we're doing so in a method that requires no ongoing maintenance from you and three you're getting a, a, a bunch of lost bandwidth back again so how does it work? It's simple MX record redirection. All you're doing is in your internet service providers control panel redirecting your MX records so that they are no longer pointing at your mail server or, at your, uh, or your perimeter. Instead they're pointing to our Komodo anti-spam gateway addresses. In your anti-spam gateway console all you're then doing is nominating your domain, so you're declaring your domain name, I'll show you what that looks like, and telling us the address, either FQDN or IP address, to which we should relay your mail. So in effect, all we're doing is becoming a mail relay, but during that relay, we're cleaning up your email for you. With your MX records thus redirected, we can start cleaning out your mail stream at the domain level, and that's great but that means that users now have to request uh, quarantine releases from the administrator, whitelisting from the administrator, blacklisting from the administrator. Users are querying the administrator for emails they're expecting. So let us go then and create some users, some mailboxes. And then users can manage themselves based on the privileges we assign to them. How do we create users? There's four methods. First, the long, slow, painful, tedious method of adding them in one at a time. But life is too short, so let's perhaps rather import our user accounts from a CSV file. And the content of that CSV file will just be an export of mail-enabled users from the LDAP server, from the domain controller, uh, and then imported into anti-spam gateway. An even easier method will be uh, LDAP or uh, AD synchronization. What we're going to do here is go along to our Active Directory server, our domain controller. We're going to create an anti-spam gateway user account. And please let's not just call it ASG. Let's uh, practice a little bit of security through obscurity and give it a slightly more devious name. We're going to apply a long, complex password to that account. Lots of uppercase and lowercase characters, lots of numerals, some special characters, and even throw in a couple of spaces, because spaces are very difficult to encode into brute force attack tools. Then explicitly define read-only rights 
to that new user account you've created. Go across to the firewall and create an inbound firewall rule for anti-spam gateways IP address so that we can talk to your server. With that all in place, come back to anti-spam gateway to the LDAP import configuration page. Put in the uh, publicly facing FQDN or IP address that we need to talk to you on. The port number over which we should be speaking. And uh, you can see from my screen I'm using the Exchange server because I'm querying port 3268, the global catalog port. Preferably use SSL to connect if your infrastructure will support it. Put in the username you've created for anti-spam gateway on your domain controller. Supply the password and define the synchronization schedule that you would like to use. Have a quick look over the base DN, filter and mail attributes just to make sure they align with yours. The defaults tend to work for 90% of people 90% of the time. Decide whether you want anti-spam gateway <coughs> excuse me, to uh, create mailboxes um, as it finds mail enabled users on the domain controller and whether you want a spam gateway to delete those mailboxes should they have been removed from the domain controller. Also, define that you want reports sent for every time anti spam gateway synchronizes with your environment and perhaps test your connection. If all works out well, save and run the synchronization and we will populate the user's container for you. An even easier way of creating your users is to use the auto import feature. And effectively what we're doing here is reading the recipient name from the mail headers, caching that name until we receive a response from your exchange server. If your exchange server responds with 250 SMTP code, mail accepted, we'll go ahead and create that user account for you. If your exchange server rather responds with mailbox not found, recipient unknown type of error messages, then we will drop that cache name, not create the user account, and thus not consume your licenses for users that don't exist. Also decide whether you want your import users automatically enabled. They don't have to be. You can leave them in a disabled state and enable them manually at a later time should you so desire. You can decide whether you want anti-spam gateway to send invitations to your users and those invitations will contain the usernames and passwords to be used so that your users can log into their own private anti-spam gateway control panels. That invitation as an email can also have its template modified so that you can put your image in the, uh, the invitation email, you can put your help desk um, email address or help desk phone number in that email. That way you can have your users contact you if they need help or if you rather want to defer that support to us just leave all the defaults and we'll help your users out when and, and uh, if they need that help. You can also decide if you want to get notified for every time a user uh, is, is discovered and the account created. So we thus have our table of users either before we create this table, during table creation, or after cre table creation, we can go and define the mail management privileges that we would like to assign to our users. Your uh, group user groups and permissions will start with two default groups, those being users and power users, but you can go and create your own users to your heart's your own user groups to your heart's content. Let us, however, have a quick look at the default standard user privileges and you should be able to see from my screen that your standard user is not allowed to release messages from quarantine, is not allowed to forward messages from their mail backup or archive, and is not allowed to whitelist or blacklist senders. These users have to request those actions from the administrator and we'll have a look at how the administrator interacts with those in a couple of minutes. Your power users, on the other hand, inherit all mail management privileges uh, by default. And as I say, you can go and start with a blank template of user permissions and assign uh, those privileges as you desire and even create a new default group so that all future discovered users automatically inherit the permissions that you wish to have assigned. So now we have filtering at a user level for inbound traffic. But anti-spam gateway also does outbound traffic filtering. The reason we do this is to try and prevent your domain name or your domain's IP address from becoming blacklisted by Spam House, Spam Cop, uh, Sorbs, or any of the other DNS BL providers. 
if you do become listed, and I'm sure there may be one or two people in the audience who have been listed before, you will know that it can take up to three days to get delisted, and during that period, your ability to send and receive emails is significantly impaired. So let's try and prevent that scenario. How do we prevent it? By defining permissions for our users. In other words, we can define whether we want user accounts uh, to be blocked, or sorry, if you want spam being sent by our users to be blocked, and if spam is detected in the outgoing stream, whether you want that user's account to automatically be locked. If you do want the account locked, you can define for how long the account should stay locked and how many times it should be automatically unlocked before the administrator has to intervene. We can also do rate-based limiting. This unfortunate user is only allowed to send 30 emails per hour or 5 emails per minute, which may be a little restrictive, but should they attempt to send the 31st email an hour or the 6th email in a minute, their account will once again be automatically locked. You can also define, as part of our outbound spam detection mechanisms, that only valid internal senders are uh, allowed to send out. And that's what the valid sender address required field means. So if a spam bot tries to send an email out from xyz123 at your domain name dot tld, we're going to know that that user does not exist, and so the automatic lock feature will again kick in. So we have a number of mechanisms available to you to uh, prevent your domain from becoming blacklisted. And thus we have outgoing filtering per user as well. So how do our users then interact with anti-spam gateway? Well, there's several mechanisms. Each of your users will get a quarantine report, and it will look a little something like that. And if you have enabled auto-login in your domain settings, your users will also have the ability to interact and manage, th sorry, interact with and manage their email directly from their reports. They will be able to release an email from quarantine, to blacklist a sender, whitelist a sender, or delete the email out of quarantine directly from the quarantine report. For those high priority users who need to know about every email going into their quarantine, you can also have on-demand quarantine alerting. Your users can opt in or opt out of this as part of their profile settings in their private control panels, but users can be strange things. How else do our users interact with anti-spam gateway? Well, as I say to you, they each get their own private uh, login. Uh, and that would look at something like this. Well, in fact, it looks exactly like this because I'm logged into my <laughs> anti-spam gateway control panel. Again, depending on the privileges being assigned to the users, there are certain levels of management that uh, the user can uh, can enact on his or on her uh, quarantined emails. And if you have opted in for uh, the archive feature, the mail backup feature, your user has certain other things that they can do with their email. For example, if they deleted an email three months ago uh, and now desperately need it back again, they can search for that email in their archive container and having found it, simply resend it to themselves and we'll restore that mail from their backup. As part of a business continuity capability, if uh, the exchange server is unavailable or if mail is unavailable, they can, by logging into their anti-spam gateway portals, continue to be email active by being able to reply, reply all, or forward emails directly through anti-spam gateway. To enhance the uh, business continuity mechanism, more in terms of disaster recovery, the archive is also of great benefit to the system or mail administrator. Excuse me while I log in again cannot have uh, concurrent user and administrative logins from the same computer at the same time. So allow me to specify the correct password <laughs> and we can get back to our administrator's control panel. So as I was trying to say, using the archive from a, a disaster recovery perspective, if the exchange server software needs to be completely rebuilt and the mail store to be repopulated, Yes, you can do that um, by restoring last night's backup from tape, NAS, or SAN, or downloading it from off-site backup. 
or you can go into anti-spam gateway simply select all emails resident in the archive and resend them all and that way we can repopulate the mail store for you that's pretty useful <laughs> Again, administrator, depending on the uh, permissions assigned to the, to the users, can also restore lost emails on a per-user basis. So we have all these management feature and capabilities which have now assigned to our users. The next thing we're going to want to know is what have our users been up to? Well, how about the first thing we want to know being where are our users enacting with their mail from? Where, which where are they logging in from? You know, logging into their own uh, uh, private uh, consoles. Well, we can tell you that. From our user's history table, we can tell you the IP address and the country that they're logging in from, when they last logged in, how long they were logged in for. And as you can see, I am currently logged in to my control panel. There she is. So every United States-based company with United States-based users, we would expect to see United States in the location column and we can even control that because as part of our geolocation restrictions the administrator can define from which countries users should be allowed to log in if uh, administrator so chooses it can also go and create rejection options so if there are certain countries that you never want to use to be able to log in from simply choose a reject rule instead of an accept rule fantastic we know where our users are logging in from but what are they doing? Well, allow me to present you with our forensic grade audit log. Forensic grade because it's encrypted and forensic grade because it cannot be altered, modified or edited in any way. Your audit log will record every mail that's received, every mail that's forwarded, every mail that's archived, every mail that's sent to quarantine. All mail released from quarantine, all whitelist sender creation exercises, all blacklist sender creation exercises, all administrative uh, domain configurations or reconfigurations. So it will record every single event that takes place through anti-spam gateway. A side benefit to that is that the report or the audit log can be exported to CSV. Your administrator can then uh, download that CSV daily, weekly, monthly, your choice, or can simply print uh, and then save it as a, as a PDF or any other type of file somewhere within the environment. Could also print it out, take those printouts and put them in some lever arched folder or similar. So that way when the compliance officer or the uh, regulatory auditor comes around, wants to know what's going on with our email, we just give them a whole pile of Libra Arch files and make them go away while we carry on with our work. So now we know everything our users have been doing too. What other benefits does Anti-Spam Gateway come with? Well, there's all the standards that you would expect, such as a delivery queue. If for any reason we cannot deliver mail to you, we will hold your mail for you in the delivery queue. So if we cannot communicate with the destination server, your email stays safe with us. When we can communicate with your exchange server again, we will simply start spooling all that mail back down to you as quickly as your exchange server can take it. Side benefit here, if you're planning an exchange server uh, upgrade anytime soon, simply go and block port 25 at the perimeter. We'll hold your mail for you. You do your exchange upgrade. When you're done, go and reopen port 25 and all that mail we held for you while you were doing your upgrade will get spooled back on down to you. Yes, that has happened a couple of times. That's great that we can help out. <laughs> we also provide full log searching. So unlike some of our competitors who are only logging quarantine events or mail rejection events, we log everything. So we have message tracking for you in the cloud and can tell you every single mail that has been delivered to the mail server or rejected or quarantined and the reason why it's been rejected and quarantined. We do full log searching outbound as well. We also do email size restriction uh, management. Um, perhaps you have a 20 meg uh, mail quota on your internal mail server, your exchange server. It's a bit restrictive, um, but the reason you're doing it is because you don't want attachments larger, larger than 20 meg either coming in from the outside world or being sent to the outside world. Well, by all means, maintain that 20 meg restriction in terms of the outbound and inbound traffic goes. But for internal traffic, go back to Exchange Server, 
create maybe a hundred megalimeter because now you have split male quotas. We do extension blocking as you probably expect and all your uh, executable file types are there for you. Whatever spam filtering mechanism you are currently using please go and add CHM in as a blocked extension. It's a Microsoft compiled HTML file. There's no reason why a valid sender is going to send one of these to a valid user. Instead, what it's being used for currently is distributing the latest version of CryptoLocker. So please go and add .chm into your list of blocked file extensions. More on the email management side. For those uh, standard users who are or have to request uh, that their quarantined items been released, that their senders be whitelisted and blacklisted, those requests over and above being flagged to you via an email alert will also be visible in the appropriate containers. So for a release request exercise, administrator would select the appropriate email, click show message and be able to review the plain text content of that message, the HTML source of that message, as well as the original view as it would be seen in Microsoft Outlook or as in Thunderbird. Administrator can then make an educated guess as to whether the email should be accepted, click the accept button and the user is going to receive the email. If administrator decides that the email should not be released, they click the reject button. The user gets an, uh, an email saying that administrator is declining the offer to release the spam to them. And uh, the email, of course, is not going to be released. Same applies for blacklist requests and the whitelist requests. More on whitelisting and blacklisting is that we supply recipient whitelisting and that might be for an abuse account, uh, postmaster account or help desk mail account. Unfortunately these do attract a little bit of spam but they also have to be op uh, open and exposed to the public so that the public can you know, report any abuse of our websites perhaps, um, be able to report uh, mail abuse to postmaster or of course users can uh, submit uh, support tickets to the help desk. Sender whitelisting is fairly obvious. Uh, we have trusted business colleagues and business partners who never send us spam. Um, if we have CRM reporting tools that never send us spam, ERP systems that never send us spam, we can go and whitelist those addresses and as such the mail will not be filtered. Recipient blacklisting is there for internal users who have no need to receive mail from the outside world. Principle of least privilege and all. The marketing intern who's only here for a couple of weeks doesn't need to receive mail from the outside world, so we declare them as a blacklisted recipient. They can still receive all their internal mail, just nothing from the outside world. Sender blacklisting, again, equally obvious. We have uh, someone who's pestering us with spam. Just go and create their uh, name at domain.tld as a blacklisted entry, or just use wildcards. Your whitelisted senders per user is an added uh, mechanism for whitelisting. We can have maybe three or four people inside our environment for whom a sender is whitelisted, but for the rest of our employees that sender will then not be whitelisted. And the contrary to that for blacklisting. So we have all these mail management features, we have all the filtering, the next thing we're going to want to do is have a look at the reports. And we give you five different types of reports. The first will be your domain statistics report. And this is going to uh, highlight total mail received, of which how much was spam, of which how much was ham, of which how much was bacon, of which how much contained malware, of which how much contained phishing links, etc., etc. Everything you would expect to see in such a report. Your quarantine report is a list of all quarantined items for all users. Your quarantine release report is a list of all the mail that your users have been releasing from quarantine, assuming they've had permission to do so, of course. Um, your reported spam report, all those emails that have got through to the user's inbox, uh, the user wants to report them as being unwanted mail, as being spam. And you could use your quarantine release report and your reported spam report to balance out your spam detection settings. Because obviously if you're seeing a lot of, of items being released from quarantine, perhaps your, uh, your filtering restrictions are a little too tight or a little too strict. You might want to, uh, in, uh, or you want to re relax them a little bit. If, on the other hand, you're seeing lots of uh, items being reported as spam, maybe it means your filtering is not strict enough. 
and you may want to change your spam detection settings based on that. The last of those reports is your user's in auto import report and this of course only applies if you've selected to have your users automatically discovered and accounts automatically created for them. So this will give you a view of the uh, mail accounts that are accepting mail inside the environment and can then also help you as part of the, that e-discovery mechanism to make sure that the people receiving mail inside your environment actually exist and you don't have two or three rogue email addresses floating around somewhere on your uh, Microsoft Exchange server. So that, from a high-level view, is your Komodo anti-spam gateway. I'm sure you'll agree it's a highly manageable, highly configurable, pre perimeter offense against spam, <laughs> phishing links, infected email attachments, and of course it's in the cloud so it's maintenance free, and because it's in the cloud, can perhaps restore some of your uh, incoming bandwidth.